Good evening and welcome to Law Talk, the show that brings the current legal events into your living room each month. And tonight, myself, James Barrett, with Mark Malachowski, are here to bring you three interesting topics that will catch your imagination. Mark, what are we starting off with tonight? Well, James, I think we're going to talk about um, someone who was slated to possibly be the next uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, John Corzine. Apparently, he ran into some kind of rough sledding in some of his financial dealings. Well, I understand we're talking about John Corzine, who was first a U.S. senator, then the governor of New Jersey. But in a high-profile election in 2010, he lost his position to Chris Christie. And I understand he went on to start an investment firm called MF Global LTD. What do you know about that? Well, I know that MF Global is uh, in bankruptcy now. And there's an uh, understanding that they lost about $600 million um, usually, uh, investing in euro debt. In Spain and Italy, uh, the sovereign debt didn't work out so well. But when you say they lost $600 million, my understanding was a little more than that, was that MF Global was actually a holding securities firm that would invest people, investors' money. But the real problem that comes out of this bankruptcy is the fact that many, many amounts of money from separate accounts that belong to clients just vanished. Well, yeah, exactly. It's kind of like tax money. It's not their money. There's about $900 million that they can't quite figure out that that, that was other people's money. And uh, what happened, all, all those accounts are frozen. And so if you had money in MF Global and you were using that to trade securities or whatever you were, I think they were doing commodities such as agricultural products and then Euro debt, which seems a little bit um, odd. But at any rate, those, all those accounts are frozen. The people who had money in there now have to wait and fill out a form and try to prove that, that they had money in, in, in MF. But my understanding is that under this type of investment firm, you're supposed to segregate uh, individual client accounts from the company's accounts. And I understand that there was a call, uh, a typical New York Stock Exchange call at the end of the day that they couldn't make. And that's what actually, and that was happened, I believe, on the 27th of October. And following that call from the New York Stock Exchange at that day, they were unable to come up with $6 billion that they had lost that day. And that's when the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission immediately were notified that there's a problem with MF Global. Well, there's an expression for that. Once the toothpaste is out of the tube, it's kind of hard to put it back in again. Yeah, I don't think I've been able to do that ever <laughs> in my life. And but, so, yeah, I think they forgot about that thing about keeping the investor money separate from their own money. That yeah, was but, a little oversight. But doesn't that, doesn't that apply to a lot of professions? You're not supposed to commingle client funds with, with house funds. Isn't that kind of like the basis for all, all types of investment in other professions? Well, yeah, you would think so. But, I mean, if they're, if they're going into government, they, I don't think they have to worry about that in government. Everything is kind of commingled in government. It's all someone else's money. So maybe this is actually a sign that he would be a make a good Fed chair because well, he's not worried about losing other people's money. So well, he, I, he's I, not restrained by those by those kind, rules. By those kind of uh, niggly little I mean, scaredy, archaic rules of how, do you, how do you control things. the yeah. funds, yeah. Right? Yeah, right? Right, right. Yeah, I, I, but here's, a, here's another interesting part. You know, Timothy Geithner, who's the Secretary of Treasury right now, right. was actually going to be up to be replaced. So if uh, Mr. Corzine was not going to go for the head of the Fed, he, there's a good chance he might have been nominated for the Secretary well, still, of Treasury. He still could be. He still could be. I understand he's unemployed now. Well, I mean, he's he's free now. He's 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 no longer uh, you know he's no longer working for MF Global because it's gone bankrupt. And you know, in the if you look at what the Fed has done, what do they they lent 15 trillion dollars to banks on short-term loans? They didn't get that back. So losing six billion compared to the 15 trillion the Fed lost, you know, I mean, that's nothing. Yeah, I it's, guess it's, it's, it's small change. Yeah, but here's here's the interesting part. There's already been an FD, FBI investigation started on MF Global. Right. And the first thing is you're already seeing the rats jump the ship. One of the top executives in MF Global has already freely admitted that the funds were commingled. And what we're waiting to see is who is actually authorizing this commingling of funds, which caused actually the firm to go bankrupt. Now, not only were they shut down because of the failure to make the call at the end of the New York Stock Exchange day, their trading day, but then on the 31st of October, they automatically declare bankruptcy. So obviously, there was a lot going on prior to the 27th of October, or I should say the 28th of October, that led MF Global to realize that they're in a serious financial condition. Well, there's been signs that MF Global is starting to have problems for a while, um, but uh, 
I think they were ma they managed to shift things around to keep every everything looking like it's on an even keel. Well, you do, you realize that they invested, as you said earlier, in in a lot of the euro the euro investments, and we're talking about Italy, Greece, Spain. And a lot of those funds that were being invested in, they're actually in some manner betting against the house. They're saying that those, those dollars, or I should say those euros, were not going to be as conducive as they believed, and that the, actually the Inter International Monetary Fund were going to be making loans to those countries, which means they would have made money on those loans that were given. But because of the tight money exchange between the IMF and those countries themselves, um, based primarily on the lack of austerity programs, MF Global got caught short. Well, my understanding was mainly Spanish and, Ital and Italian sovereign debt. Yeah. So it wasn't actually they weren't investing in private enterprise. They're actually investing in the in the currency. The country. The, the, the country itself. The, the country itself and its ability to pay back, uh, you know what what it owed to the the central euro bank or IMF or whoever. Well, and and, yeah. and really what you're looking at is like, what is the chance with their high, um, you know, debt to GNP ratio? What's the chance of getting another loan, really? So really what they're betting, it seems to me that they were betting, well, these guys would get you know, floater loans to get them through these rough patches, right. when maybe looking at it, you know, the central bank and the IMF are looking at it and saying, like, these guys' debt to G you know, uh, gross domestic pro product is just it's too close. What are they, I don't know if they were, some of them over 100%. Well, they were like over 100%. That. It's yeah, like, the, like the country of Greece was 125, right. 130 percent. It's kind of interesting, you know. Like we, I think uh, Switzerland's is something like 25. China's like 20. We're like 84. So we're yeah, we, we're, we're we're right on the coattails of Greece. We're not yeah, very and far. that's and that's part of the problem was that I mean, uh, in, those the last, in the last three years we spent 20 trillion dollars, and we make a, we make a, our, our GNP is somewhere between six or seven trillion dollars. They call it 13, but I think that's nonsense. So. Basically, in the last three years, we spent three times our our GNP. So I mean, uh, we're 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 a couple we're months or years away from. Well, Greece. I got a question. Yeah, Do you believe far. that the MF Global is just another sign that the entire the entire industry once again the Securities and Exchange came down on them? They declared a bankruptcy. They found uh, segregated funds were not being treated properly. Do you think that's just another sign that uh, the the Wall Street guys are getting away with murder while well, the actually, poor people on the street are not getting anything. I actually think this is actually almost a healthy sign here because they did a bankruptcy. And I'm looking back on the other things where they did the bailouts where, you know, you have bankruptcy courts that are set up for these kind of things. And the bailouts, I think, um, destabilized the whole system. And so this, I think, is actually done the proper way. Doing a bankruptcy is the way it should be handled um, because otherwise, what would happen? You do a bailout, and the taxpayers would be on the hook for that six billion. Right. This way, the investors they're going to be on the hook for the six billion, but that's the way <laughs> bankruptcy normal works. So I think this is actually one of the healthier examples, and I think all those previous bailouts should have gone through bankruptcy. Why should the taxpayer be on the hook for someone who makes a wild card investment? Well, here's the here's the one issue here is because there, there's a lot of other investor firms that were involved with MF but, but, Global. But, but even we're looking at this and what we're talking about the SPIC, the Security Protection Investment Corp Co Corporation, and I'm not sure how much coverage these people will get on that. Well, there was actually, some numbers like very a, little. There's very like a little quarter million and a half million, but I don't know if that's I don't know what what protection these people have. I think they're on the outs pretty much. Okay. Well, my I'm, I'm not sure my about that. I'm not sure about is that. Because of the protections that are provided, they're like a sort of a FDIC uh, right. for the Exchange Commission and for companies that do that kind of investment. But the problem is that their limitations are about $100,000 per investor. And so what's going on here is that when people have lost millions and millions of dollars, that's kind of where it goes. All right. And so they, it looks like the it looks like the investors are people who even traded through them. Yeah. Right? Using it even as a broker it might be on the outs. Okay, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we keep track of where MF Global is going to go? But what's our second topic for tonight, Mark? Well, keeping in the uh, the, the money uh, type of uh, uh, venue here, we're going to talk about money laundering. And uh, in Constitutional Corner, we're talking about, you know, really these money laundering laws were put together in the 1970s. When remember, I don't know, some people can remember the Scarface movie, the second Scarface movie with El Pacino. And where they're bringing suitcases of hundred-dollar bills into the bank, into the bank, and it, duffel bags, and duffel bags, bags. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, duffel right. bags, and uh, Chi Chi get the yeah, but yeah, I, right. Chi Chi <laughs> get the ale. Yeah, and I so anyway, that. and so you know, and at that time, ten thousand dollars was a lot of money, but now you know, ten thousand dollars, it's we've got so much inflation because we printed so much money. 
Uh, 10,000 is not really that well, great. Wait a minute. I, I understand that the original Money Laundering Act started in 1970. Right. And that is where the, the $10,000 amount that you just mentioned came up. In other words, if you move more than $10,000, and it doesn't matter, uh, if you move more than 10000 you could have it in traveler's checks, you could have it in securities, you could have it in cash. Any combination that reaches $10,000 doesn't have to be cash. Well, you know what the problem with that is? I understand that you're the banks are supposed to report, uh, a real estate supposed to report. There seems to be a whole nature of professionals and agencies and businesses that are supposed to report well, if see, you deal with something with $10,000. Well, in the 1970s, it was rather loosely enforced. But in 1989, it, it was, uh, you know, the, the first one was the Bank Secrecy Act, right, which really was the opposite of the Bank Secrecy Act. It was the Bank Disclosure. Oh, yeah, the, the Bank, bank disclosure, disclosure for the, but for the quite Government often, Act. Quite, quite often, in order to pass a bill, Congress calls yeah. it something that happens, you know, so they call it the Widows and Orphans Bill. When you know feeding the widow of orphan bills, when they're actually shooting widows and orphans, so right. they call it the bank secrecy. But act. then they charge them for the bullets. <laughs> yeah, and but they, you know, so Congress quite often, and in fact, there's a Virginia law that the title of a bill actually has to portray what it's really about. Well, wouldn't that be a shock to the country if the <laughs> but, bills were actually named what they really did? Yeah, but usually in the U.S. Congress, they're pretty much the opposite of what what they really do. And anyway, so in 1989, they really firmed it up. They 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 well, did. What did they do? They added, you know, they added a new law. And that made it so casinos, card clubs, brokers, insurance, uh, insurance agents, fresh and metal dealers, automobile and boat dealers, and real estate agents all had to report if they thought someone was doing something suspicious. But wait a minute. What's and suspicious? They would, they, well, can what, you tell me what suspicious is? Well, suspicious could be belonging to the wrong political party, not uh, having the right hairdo. Don't it give me could, going into the politics it, it could, here. We're talking could, about money laundering. It could be just about anything, really. Um, there's no real... There's no real, uh, I mean, one guy was said that the guy lived a la lavish life, lifestyle, apparently, and he mentioned drugs. And so that was enough. And so the person who didn't report him got in trouble on that. There was a Wait case a minute. What are the fines or what are the penalties for the people that don't report? Well, it can be, it'd be, you could lose your license. Let's say you're a broker. You could lose your broker's license. Let's, well, you know, you could. pretty dramatic. You could lose your livelihood. So, um, and so, and it's not just, um, Okay, so one thing they could say if you, it's, it's ten thousand dollars if it's a if it's a product of a crime. Also, if you're moving ten thousand dollars to disguise a transaction, right? So it encompasses all kinds of things, and uh, it's really quite vague. And um, and so Justice Douglas, when the Supreme Court looked at this, and the, and the civil rights basically took a drubbing on this from the Supreme Court um, when they allowed this law to go through. But Justice uh, Douglas said that you know the the Bank Secrecy Act. Is, you know, it was like George Orwell's big brother. I mean, he says that, you know, he's, he's not ready to agree that, you know, that an America is so possessed by evil that we must, you know, l you know level all constitutional protections. I mean, basically, he's saying you're just like steamrolling well, over the okay, Constitution. Okay, so with what, what all these laws are actually doing, though, they're demanding that banks are the main source because everyone, ha most people have a bank account. And what banks are now required to do is report this. And I understand because there's so many people that do transactions of $10,000 or more, the, the, uh, effectively the federal government's inundated reports, millions of reports on an annual basis well, it doesn't showing have to, transactions. But it doesn't have to be that. You could be going down to the post office to do a $20 money order, right? And if you're looking suspicious, you can get reported. But see, that also complicates the how, how is the reporting supposed to add up to the fact that there are so many reports coming into the government? How are they able to determine who's actually doing something well, illegal versus simple. something? simple. They raise taxes. They hire more government agents. Well, that's... <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what they just did in the most recent bill. Like in the, uh, the health care bill, they hired 20,000 auditors. IRS right. agents to so audit you know, everybody over healthcare. Auditor, right, so right, like, right, right. you'll have one guy working and 30, 40 guys auditing. You know, and that's just, that's the way it works. But so, wait a minute. This, there's, there's more to this because I know there's a big push right now anti the, uh, the money laundering acts where they're effectively saying, in fact, it was uh, Ron, President Reagan's uh, uh, chief of staff or, his, let's see, excuse me, his uh, attorney general, Jeff Yotter, who actually said that this is actually the biggest invasion of privacy that this country's ever seen. And the fact that you're mandating that every professional that deals with money Every, every broker that deals with money, every salesperson that deals with money, and every bank yeah, that deals with money. Yeah, we're talking about car dealers, boat dealers, real estate agents, anyone who's doing any big ticket item. Yeah. It's required to report stuff to Treasury if they even think that it might be suspicious, right? And so it's a lot like you used to have, like in Russia, they had the communist committees, and you were inform on your neighbors, and the, and the more informed, the more political favors you get, and if your competitors aren't, you don't want your competitors around. You've done someone informing. Well, then you can audit the competitors and drive them out of business. 
So it's really a, a method of complete government control over private enterprise through kind of a nefarious technique of, of political pressure. Oh, well, you know, the, the problem with this is, is it, it seems to be one more step in the direction of controlling the populace by using every normal business as an, as an enforcement agency. That, but who's paying for that? Or is the government reimbursing banks for doing this? Is the government reimbursing car salesmen for doing this? Is the, is the government reimbursing boat dealers, real estate dealers? Are these people being compensated for the time it takes no, to make no, these no, reports? No, no, that, no, that just raises the price of all goods because they have to spend this extra time doing it. And, of course, the government has to raise taxes to get more auditors. And so it's just a way of having a ballooning government and individual liberty is basically steamrolled and this kind of thing. Well, you know, the, the problem with this, Mark, is it's actually deeper than that. This could be just another source of a control of the populace to ensure that they don't have the ability to do anything to change the government methods. And that, that's what's scary about this. Well, I think it's, but I see the more problem is, is like, if you're going around, if you go, if, like, say, if you're politically connected and you're the car dealer in one town, right, and you go and turn three or four other car dealers in, right, and then you got the political pool, the government comes and audits those so they're out of business, and then you're the only surviving thing. So it eliminates competition because the person who's in best with the government doing the most informing, making the most political contributions and all this, they can wipe out their competition. So it basically gets rid of the free market. Well, I understand that uh, Senator Kerry is one of the, the main proponents of this, and that's, and that's something we're going to get to next. But I think we have one more good topic tonight, Mark. What would that be? Okay, well, this is kind of an interesting item. Um, this is called a uh, petition uh, for finding of innocence. And what happens, a lot of times people get arrested, but they don't get convicted. A lot of times uh, people get arrested and the, the DA doesn't file any charges. And so when they go to uh, put on a job application, and they have you ever been arrested, you've ever been convicted, they go, yeah, yeah you know, I've been arrested, and they don't get that job. So well, Wait a minute, how, how is the, uh, the factual innocence, how is that actually dealt with? I mean... There's got to be a method. Uh, how do you make a determination that you qualify for a PFI? Well, a PFI, you would have to get an NG. You'd have to get a not guilty, or you'd have to have no charges filed against you, right? Okay, when you say and charges, I, though, we're talking about you're arrested, but when you go to the district attorney, you're talking about there's not a complaint filed against okay, you well, in, in court. What happens when you get arrested is the police arrest you. They, they, they come up with some charges that they think are applicable. They forward those to the district attorney, and they make a recommendation that you know we should you you should right. file charges right. on this and this right. and this guy and the district attorney looks at him and you know in a lot of cases district attorney tend to overcharge because they figure that's a good way of of right. of, of settling cases because so if you shoplift something they'll say well it's a robbery right and that way you know oh well, my gosh you'll settle for the shoplifting so it's a tradition for DAs to overcharge it's unconstitutional legal but it's a matter of course um, but on the other hand sometimes they've got absolutely no case. And uh, they choose not to charge. They don't charge at all because they just they, they know it's going nowhere. Well, you know that uh, there are cases that are on right now where people are arrested for what apparently are violent felonies. Right. But when it gets to the district attorney, they decide not to do anything. But if the person that's arrested is actually here illegally, they could be deported when there's that when they were picked up for absolutely no reason. Well, that's interesting because that's that is a, a parallel um, parallel jurisdiction. You have federal jurisdiction for the um, uh, enforcement for the ICE, right? Right. And you've got your state. Now, this has changed quite a bit. Used to be you had to be booked for the state to call ICE, right? And it used to be called the INS, right? But now that it's ICE, as soon as you're picked up and the computers are so good, they know about the arrest. Right. So you don't even really have to be booked now. ICE knows, and a lot of times they can say, "Okay, we're going to release you." Right? We're not even going to hold you. We're not going to press The police track. are going to release you. Yeah, the state will. But as a courtesy, they hold it for ICE because... There's, the, a, there's an immigration there's, hold. Well, there's concurrent jurisdiction, the federal jurisdiction. So that's a whole issue there. Right. But getting back to your PFI, what you want to do, with, what's good... Okay, there was, a, there was what, a, a 530? What is it, a 530? It's, no, no, it's 850.8 no, or 530.8. I mean, no, but, there's a, but this is, a, but this is, a, um, this is 851.8, but there's also a 530, right? There's a usual expungement. Right, and there's also uh, yeah. Oh, the 12034. 12034. But 12034, which is effectively a a record clearance. Right. Does you still have to report that to almost most jobs you apply for, any government job, any security job, license, you still like a state license, like sorry. a state, any kind of state license, you still have to report the, uh, under a 12034. And then there's also um, 
pre-trials, there's pre-trials or versions. There's a couple other things that kind of are similar to this. But, but the, they don't get rid of the, the record but, but of the, the arrest. But what's good about the PFI, not only does it, it you know, dissolve the record of the arrest, but then it dissolves itself six months later. Right. So even the, so like say you did something on, on one of the other record clearances, well, you could clear your mur murder charge, right? But you still have the, uh, the, the, basically the petition saying, well, please clear my murder charge, and that shows up, so it's almost just as bad. You know? well, they, so this, this actually dissolves the petition itself after six months. Okay, well, actually, you know, to build on that, the, the format for this is very simple. You're arrested, not charged, or found not guilty. Then you go back, and you have to file with the arresting police agency. You have to file what effectively is the, the petition t for the PFI. The police agency has 60 days to respond. Well, they usually don't. And they don't usually don't respond. That's the problem. Because for misdemeanors, um, you're, in fact, the, the law states that you can't really file the PFI with the courts until you've exceeded the statute of limitations. Which is on, a year. It's year. usually a year on a misdemeanor. Right. But for felonies, it's three years. But, where but the, you have to file your PFI within two years. Yeah, but see, that's the problem. So there's, a, have, there's a hurdle. Unless in, you have good cause. You can show good cause. But that good cause has to be brought before a judge, and there has mm -hmm. judges have discretion to waive. In fact, the district attorney has discretion to waive waive the statute of limitations on that crime. But if the district attorney doesn't, you still won't do it. You can still bring it before a judge to hear an early PFI petition. And right. if the judge says they can waive the statute of limitations, which effectively says, okay, we know that a felony is three years. We know the law says if you don't file within two years well, no, from let, the date let, of arrest. Let's clarify for people what we're saying is like, say if you're arrested for a felony, right? Yes. Okay, which would be even shoplifting over $1,000 could be a felony, yeah, right? Grand theft. Okay, it could be grand theft. Something, so over $1,000, like I said, $10,000, $1,000 is not worth much anymore. Right. right. They made these laws a long time ago <laughs> when $1,000 was probably worth a lot $10, of money. $10,000. It could right? be right? worth, yeah. Yeah, so, but now, you know, you, you shoplift $1,000 and one cent of some stupid shoe, right? That's a felony. Right, which means you can do more than a year, and in in, in 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 you won't go to county. You will actually go to prison. Well, that's because your your penalty is going to be a year or more. Well, yeah, a year and a day. You in a prison. Yeah, a but year you're, and a day. you're not in county. You're going up you're with going, the big house. You're going to the big house, baby. You're going to the big house. Going to the big house. Okay, you'll so, be rolling up the river. Okay, so th from the date you're arrested, or charges, or whatever, basically the date you're arrested, the, the DA has three years to file those charges. So even if they let you go and they let you run around for two years and 363 they can still bring up the charge again. on that on that second year and 363 days or four days, they can still file that charge. Exactly. So and, but that's see, what that's, that's, that's the, what but, that means. But see, the whole problem with this whole setup is is that the PFI that leaves a lot of discretion in number one, the police agency to decide that to if they if you want them to admit they did they everything did something wrong, they yeah. did something wrong. That's just not going to happen. Yeah, they're very never right. going to admit yeah, right. that. So then the next stop is you have to go to the DA, and the DA is going to say, "Oh, I'm sorry, he's innocent. We'll admit to that, and that means that we'll let him go. So we're going to grant the waiver of the statute of limitations under the law, right. and then you can go before a judge and ask for a PFI. Right. But you know what? The judge has to review the original arrest." and what the charges were, and then they have to make a determination. There was no reasonable cause for this to even be ex Well, the burden, the burden is on the, the person who was arrested. The petitioner. The petitioner. The burden, the burden of proof is on the petitioner, and that's kind of tough. Yeah, well, the petitioner actually has to bring in, they have to bring character references right. in. They have to bring, uh, effectively, the history of their life. And if it's their first well, time that'll, arrest. Well, that'll help, but they actually have to bring in, you know, all the evidence for the case. Yeah, but they, they like don't have all the evidence. Well, but they have to retry the case in front of the judge in a way. They, they have the burden of showing that they were innocent. Yeah, but here's the problem. If somebody is arrested but not charged, they can't just go to the police station and get the police report. Right. You know why? Because it, it, they, the police department would say it's at the DA. The DA would say, well, I didn't charge, so I, I don't have a record on it. I don't have a file on it. But on the other hand, the, the police report is admissible in this case, even though it's hearsay. Well, here's the big problem. Hearsay. You bring up the magic word of this. Hearsay now becomes an operative because anything that's said in the police report is now considered as factually correct. And that's where the judge and the district attorney are going to be looking. First, the district attorney will be looking at it, whether or not he's going to give a waiver on the statute of limitations. Right. And then the judge is going to be looking at it, whether or not he, he's going to grant the, the petition for the PFI. Fact, factual innocence. Yeah, right. is there a factual innocence? But you know what? In my experience of doing these, you know what the district attorney says? If he was charged, he did it. We just decided not to prosecute. Right. And that's, and that's where that seems to be the tendency of the district attorney's offices because, once again, 
that even if they have a belief that, that oh, maybe this person deserves it, what they don't want to do is, let, uh, is be part, have their name on letting people back in society without proof that they have a criminal record. Right. And that's, so there's a big, there's a wall built for, uh, for the petitioner. So you're saying if someone was charged and then it was dismissed. Yeah. Then. Or no, no, they were arrested but not charged. Yeah. Or dismissed. They have a problem because what happens is the district attorney still will not want their name on waiving the statute. They're not going to want their name on a green. See, a district so, attorney. So the thing with a misdemeanor is not a big a deal. Because a misdemeanor you're a misdemeanor, no you've got a one year statute of limitations. You've got two years no to problem. file your two year file. Now, my question is okay, let's say if you've got a, a DA who's a pain in the rear, you've got a judge who's a pain in the rear, and they say, no, we're not going to grant a waiver. I've got a felony. Okay, I'm supposed to do this in two years. Right. Can I come back three years in a day? And say, well, my good cause and absence of prejudice. Now I want to file my PFI. You're out of time. The reason I couldn't, but but I'm but I can, but you can do it with a showing of good cause. But the showing of good cause would be that the, the ju both the judge and the district attorney were idiots. Were, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that the judge and the district attorney <laughs> decided that they were going to not grant any waiver of the statute of limitations, even though the judge had. Well, the maybe if you have a real rotten case, you're better to let it run and then come back to look for the good cause after you you. Well, after you let the statute run. I don't know. But you I can't do that because tricky. now That's you've right. already violated the statute that you can even bring the PFI under. If you cannot bring... But my understanding is you can bring the PFI on after the two years if you show good cause. Well, you know what? There's so many citizens in this economy right now that have been arrested for crimes, never charged. And so this is why this subject is being brought up tonight. Because right now, with the economy and the state it is, people trying to get jobs, people trying to get new employment, better employment. Yeah, and if they have an arrest. And if they have an arrest, they're going to be preempted from that. Right. And, and also, the, employers are doing background checks. Oh my they're doing God. credit checks. Yeah. With the computers, they can check everything. They out. can check everything, and they can do it very quickly and, and not for very much money. They can get a complete background on everybody. Right. So these PFIs are now coming. This is going to be a brand new market. And, the, and I believe that the judges and the district attorneys and the police department is going to be a, under a lot of pressure to start reacting differently to them. Well, also, I think there is supposed to be a liaison officer within the DA's office or within the oh. police, police department that's supposed to facilitate these things. But you know how that works sometimes. They're usually on vacation or right. they'll be back well, on Friday or something like that. Or yeah. they're a part-timer. Yeah. And as a part-timer... As a part-timer, they don't necessarily will take the time to look under all the PFI requests. Because in this market, I already know, the PFI requests are going, they're skyrocketing. And because... So it looks like the only thing you can do, you, 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 let, you, you go to the police, you let your 60 days lapse, because you're not going to get anywhere there. Right. You file your motion, and you hope you get a judge that, and you argue to the judge, well, it is an innocent person. I mean, yeah. as an innocent person, it should be immediate relief. Okay, well, listen, you know, Mark, I, I really appreciate this last conversation about the PFI, because I'm going to tell you something. PFI is something that is a critical to society to have allow people to get their jobs, be able to be reemployed under these conditions. When they were never convicted. And when they were never convicted. And tonight, that's another take on Law Talk. And I hope that everybody tonight has gotten something very critical out of this. The law is an ever-changing presence, and we're trying to make it work. Thanks, Mark. Okay, good to see you. Okay.